the danger of the word my. The moment I define something as mine, like it's my kingdom, my glory, all of these sinful things begin to happen. Now when I switch over to a mentality that puts God at the center, and I say, as creator God, all of this exists for his glory, and all of this exists it's for his kingdom, now I have a whole different shift in, in the mental process because I can have peace. I exist for his glory, and when I exist for his glory, he'll provide everything that I have need of, right? He's king. In his kingdom, he takes care of me. And, and, and when I remove him from the throne and I put myself on the throne and I say, I'm king, and, and I have to provide for myself, I have to take care of myself, because he even says, okay, with your enemies, bless them. I'll take care of them for you. Don't worry about your enemies. Yes, you're going to have enemies. Bless them. Bless those who persecute you. Why? Because that's what the king takes care of. That's not what I have to take care of. But in my kingdom, it's survival of the fittest. In my kingdom, it's I'll take care of myself. Thank you very much. teaching tips and uh, I'm going to talk about something that I can't say that I've ever mastered completely but that I I'm conscious of okay and it's the danger of the word my okay so so let's go let's talk a little bit okay um, humanism Humanism is when, um, let's see, what would the definition? An ethical stance that human beings have the right and responsibility to, to give meaning and shape to their own lives. Like, that's basically, I'm allowed as a humanist to place humans and human will and meaning at the center of everything. And then I take God and I place him outside of that or I position him within that and everything within that circle is for me and I give shape and meaning to my own life. We have to be very careful because even within Christian circles it's very easy for humanistic philosophies to come in that it's all about me, that it's all about my glory. God exists for my glory and, and when I begin to do that I begin to um, I begin to have a, a bad shift because the moment uh, the moment I define something as mine, like it's my kingdom, my glory, all of these sinful things begin to happen. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like as soon as I'm worried about my money, I begin to worry. I have anxiety and fear. I, I begin to to. Um, become, you know, upset at things and, and fretting. And, and I begin to worship things that provide instead of trusting in the Lord. Now, when I switch over to a mentality that puts God at the center, and I say, as creator God, all of this exists for his glory, and all of this exists it's for his kingdom, now I have a whole different shift in, in the mental process because I can have peace. I exist for his glory, and when I exist for his glory, um, he'll provide everything that I have need of, right? He's king. In his kingdom, he takes care of me. And, and, and when I remove him from the throne and I put myself on the throne and I say, I'm king, and, and I have to provide for myself, I have to take care of myself. Because he even says, okay, with your enemies, bless them, I'll take care of them for you. Don't worry about your enemies. Yes, you're going to have enemies, bless them. Bless those who persecute you. Why? Because that's what the king takes care of. That's not what I have to take care of. But in my kingdom, it's survival of the fittest. In my kingdom, it's I'll take care of myself. Thank you very much. I will, you know, one of my mottos when I was young, and I've really tried to adjust is you'll respect me one way or another. You'll respect me as your friend, or you'll respect me as your enemy, but either way, you're going to respect me. Okay, that's not a biblical stance, right? That's saying in my kingdom, I will have and earn respect. 
when I'm in his kingdom, what I care about is that everything that I do is, is pleasing and bringing him glory and bringing him respect. Whether or not I get respect from somebody doesn't necessarily matter anymore because my focus and my shift changes. Mine is a determiner and, and it determines ownership or possession. And so when I use the word my in anything, I have to be somewhat aware of a heart change that, that has a potential to, um, to take ownership of something that really isn't mine. So real quick, hey Amy, uh, Tabby, some boss is, oh, you guys use abbreviations. It's hard to say your name. SMZ, uh, Baba. <laughs> um, let's see, Mara, Mara Aldrin, Miranda, Jennifer, Teresa May, Mugwump, uh, Kayla. It's good to see you guys. It's okay. So, so humanism puts humans at the center, removes God from the center. As a believer, when I commit my life to, to Christ, I am essentially saying I am no longer the center. I am making you the center. All my life is about bringing you glory. And so my mission statement at that time becomes for his glory. And I abandon for my glory. For my glory brings me pleasure, brings me ultimately pain right but you, you get the mind shift okay so let's let's shift this mindset of the the dangers of a humanistic philosophy and, and all of that, that 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 has a play over to us as parents especially in regards to homeschooling uh, there's this wonderful story it's in Luke uh, chapter 2 verse 41 through 52 and every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And when Jesus was 12 years old, preteen here, was that a tween? When Jesus was a tween, they attended the festival as usual. So Jesus was used to this. He knew Jerusalem. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was just with all the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, now can you imagine? You got on a trip and you're like, okay, he must be riding with, with the relatives back in the back. And tonight he'll show up for dinner because he knows that we're all heading home. And he doesn't. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. Total homeschooler. This is proof that Jesus was a homeschooler. Like, he wasn't hanging out with his own peeps. He was looking to hang out with the older people in the temple. <laughs> my, my son, um, when he was a teenager, he would go to Tim Hortons, which is a local coffee shop, in the community that we lived in and at night all the old people from the community like 60s into 70s 80s i think one of the guys was 80 years old they'd all sit around and play cards all night drinking they would drink like you know hot chocolate and coffees and stuff like that but my son would go down and that's just where he wanted to hang out like he loved hanging out with all the retirees in the community he was better known by all the the older people in the community than anyone else in our family and, um, and he just connected better with that group of people. So funny, it, I'm way off topic, but funny now, he, uh, he recently just got a promotion and he's a property manager of a over 55 um, uh, apartment complex. So everybody that he deals with in his daily activities at over 55 and he's delighted because that's his crowd right so he he's in his 20s and he's managing uh, a complex that's full of nothing but people over 55 why because he's a homeschooler he was socialized to be able to connect with all kinds of people that's what socializers do they don't have to connect with just people their own age while everybody else as in teenagers were going out and hanging out with other teenagers making bad choices he was drinking coffee with older people asking them questions and trying to find out 
what would you do differently in life and how, how would, what advice would you give for this and, and all of that. So this is the verse I would look to to say Jesus was most likely homeschooled um, because he, was, he chose to be hanging out with um, all the teachers and listening to them and asking questions. That was just the crowd he was comfortable with. So I'm just kind of being facetious here just so I can <laughs> give you a heads up. Okay, his parents didn't know what to think. They said, son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. Mary had her hands full. Now, Jesus, Jesus didn't sin, but she had her hands full. Okay, let me, I'm going to qualify that in a minute. Jesus like, but, but why did you need to search? He asked, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. And then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with all the people. Okay, this conflict, like they're terrorized. Where is Jesus? Looking for him for three days and finally he's hanging out in the temple. Now that means it's four days because they looked for him for three days and they had, they, they, one day of traveling. Um, so they had, I don't know how many total days. Let's see, three days. Yeah, no, that was probably five days because they had to travel out a day, back a day, and then three days of looking for him. So maybe five days that his family is searching for him. And, and then he's just like, what, what's the big deal? I'm, I'm about my father's business. I'm like, I'm in my father's house. And, and they're like, you made us frantic. Okay, right here is this conflict that we see. If we begin to approach, not that I think our kids should be wandering off for five days, but if we begin to approach a parenting philosophy of our family exist for his glory, does that shift in the narrative begin to change our worldview and begin to change the way we approach things? Because what I find is, as my children get older, I hold tightly to this my children. These are my sons. These are my daughters. And almost every time there tends to be this little ugh, where the Holy Spirit has to remind me, all of this is for my glory. This isn't for your glory. I'm doing something here. Why can't you perceive it? Like step out of the way. Just like Mary, they couldn't understand what they is. And, and, and they said they did not understand what he meant. It's like that Oh, what does this mean? And, and in homeschooling especially, we have to look at why do we do this? What is the purpose that we do this? We do this for his glory, right? The, because public education, because putting our children under the counsel of the ungodly is not going to yield glory for his kingdom and bring him glory. We want our children to be trained and counseled and raised in the, in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord so that when they grow, they, they continue to bring him glory, to serve him, to be about his business and not to be about my business. There's nothing sadder than watching our children move on and, and become so self-focused in, in my kingdom, right? It was the prodigal son who actually took the inheritance and said, this is about me. I want my inheritance now and went and lived a my centered life. We don't want that for our children. We want our children to understand this is, you, you exist for his glory. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. The scriptures tell us that he knew you, he knew your name before he laid the foundations of the earth. Like that's how special you are in his overall purpose. But at the end of the day, this is not about you. God is not, does not exist for you. We exist for him and we exist for his glory. He doesn't exist for our glory. And there's this constant struggle because we grew up so much in a humanistic philosophy that I'm at the center. I'm at the center. All I need to do is say, hocus pocus God, and he'll do whatever I command him to do as long as I know the right formulas and all these things instead of being focused on for his glory. Okay, so when I take possession of my kids, my kids, my son, my daughter, I begin to shift that focus to my agendas. I want it to be my story. And sometimes there's this major little break where all of a sudden it's like, wait, 
where is where where did my son go where did my daughter go and then i find out oh wait they're in another place and and the holy spirit has to remind me that this is not about your story this is about his story and even sometimes even as us as homeschoolers like we're trained we want them to be world changers i want every one of my kids to be a world changer and but he knows what it actually takes he knows what it takes to take a shepherd boy to a king and that path isn't always there right and not that that you know i was thinking about david even he david david was a lot of the time when he was standing in front of goliath he was about his father's business about God's business but when he stood on the rooftop and looked at Bathsheba he suddenly became about his glory and his kingdom and and suddenly what happens as soon as we go to that my kingdom we begin to to do things that that just begin to collapse and I think in our society this is my own theory but in our society this is why we have so much anxiety and so much depression and fear and health issues because we're we've gotten so focused on man at the center and 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 it all being about me and my that then we have to find a way to protect and grow and maintain these kingdoms that we feel we've built if we can just begin to shift our focus to for his glory for his kingdom what's happening today in my life for his glory it changes my whole focus when I go there. And let me ask, okay, if anybody who's watching, if you want to participate, you don't have to. Think about this morning. Think about this morning in your relationships, in your parenting, in your situations. What would you say your focus was? Did you, did you try to maintain a focus that said, for His glory, right? Father who's heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like this is for your glory, that's what I exist for. Or was there just a moment where it was like, I'm the center of this, this is for my glory, I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm ang upset, I'm whatever, because it's, 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 it's supposed to be about my glory. And, and can you feel like the shift of thinking, what if this today, what if the rest of today is just for his glory? How do I live my life forward? And what about my parenting style? If our family exists for the glory of God, what happens to my parenting style? Like, like do, I, do I somehow have, feel a shift in the urgency to train my children to know God and to understand uh, why they exist as well because because it's so easy to just kind of get through the motions and go through what society is telling us and and we can be so focused on on those things in our kingdoms and not realize the urgency that we have and as society is is basically as kingdoms are collapsing because they the humans have put themselves at the center of this what what we need are people who will stand up and say, it's for his glory. We miss the mark. The, the moment you shift the focus from his to mine, this is what happens. It's what happened in the garden. We, over and over and over and over again, what we see is God say, this is what I intend for you. This is how you bring me glory. Keep your eyes on me. Do what I've asked. Right? And, and what happens? We see the children of Israel over and over and over again begin to say, it's about us. It's about us. In fact, in the book of Micah, where God is like, you guys are bringing me sacrifices and you're honoring me and you're wondering why I'm not like jumping to your commands. But the reality is like, you're not even like, you're just giving service, but I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not at the center of what's happening. And so I just, I, I feel like, you know, for me in my life, especially, I have kids in different places. I have younger kids. I guess my youngest now is 11. Um, I think he's 11. Maybe he's 12. He's 12. He's maybe 12. I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, he's about that age. And then I have, I have older adult children. And sometimes just being in a place where I'm able to say, for his glory, how do I serve my family for his glory? He's 11, Kristen says. Praise God for a wife. 
Man, God looked at man and he said that man will never be able to keep track of his children's ages. And so we need, I need to make him, give him a helpmate who can help him remember his children's ages. And, and he was right. He was right. Every time I have to take a kid to the doctor or go to the pharmacist, they're like, "How? Old, what's the birth date? And I'm like, your guess is as good as mine. I can't hardly tell you my birth date. How am I supposed to know my nine kids? Um, <laughs> okay. Out there. So, something that, that I want to be reminded of and something that I would challenge you, to, like Mary, um, it, they returned to Nazareth, and, and she was, he was obedient to them, and his mother stored all these things in her heart. That I would just ask that we're able to be aware of, and maybe even begin to have that mindset, that even in our homeschool, in our families, and the relationships that we have, the way we train our children, right? we get what we lead, that we begin to lead from a perspective of, for his glory. It's for his glory that we exist, and that we can we can bring him honor, we can help advance his kingdom instead of advancing our own kingdoms. So that's my teaching tip for today. Hopefully that was helpful. And um, I certainly would not say that I have always been good at this. And um, uh, it's something that I appreciate very much when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is so good guys. And as believers, the greatest gift we have is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it. He's like, man, he's going to comfort. He's going to counsel. He's going to convict. Like He's going to help you live out this life that you need to live in a very sinful world and, and sinful and fallen world. But the Holy Spirit is going to, he's going to empower you. And, and we, we have the ability to just ask the Holy Spirit, help me in this area. Help me to recognize areas where I'm building my own kingdoms and where if I just get busy being about his glory, I feel all the fruits of the Spirit. I really, you know, I've really tried hard for one week to just be like, ask myself in every situation, is this for my glory or is this for his glory? And, um, and I'm recognizing when I'm about his glory, I have peace. Like he, he handles the outcomes. It's all about his deal. I can't do anything about it anyways, except just make sure that my life is work is bringing him glory right and i have peace i have more joy i have more confidence and and it's like ah i'm beginning to understand something the tension the anxiety the fear the depression anything that i was feeling over here was because i was out of alignment with what god has asked of me and so um i'm not sure why i said that all over again anyways hey guys i hope that was um, somewhat of a blessing and a challenge to you. I hope that um, as you look at your children today and, and your, your spouses and uh, the relationships in your life, that you're able to ask that question uh, for his glory. Do we exist for his glory? And if not, what can we do to align ourselves to, to, to operate according to his glory and um, in all things that we do? Okay. Well, awesome. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. And uh, summer is coming. It is so much fun to see people who are saying, posting pictures saying, hey, we did it. We had a good year. So much fun to see people who survived their first year homeschooling and, and are going to homeschool again. If you are one of those people that, that um, you were going to homeschool, you homeschooled one year, if you're on the fence, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, Right? If you're on the fence and you're thinking, oh, maybe I'll send my kids back, let, let us, if, I, if we have to, we'll do a teaching tip and I'll give you my best sales pitch. Why not to do that? But for everybody else who's, who is kind of forced into homeschooling and decided to stay homeschooling, uh, boy, we just applaud you and we are so excited for you because the second year is easier than the first year. You're just going to fine tune things and, and make things continually better. And, um, and God bless you. And we'll talk to you next Tuesday uh, at 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. All right. God bless you guys.